If you want to take your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 10, I'll be reading from there soon, but, but for a minute I want to tell you a story. Um, a few years back, my wife Ruthie and I found ourselves in a very difficult financial predicament, and in our case, it was just due to excess spending on credit cards. My greatest sin, weakness, is greed and materialism and keeping up with the Joneses. I tend to default toward wanting wanting more, wanting better, and um, so I've struggled with that all my life. Um, the seminar that I'm going to teach today, thank God, to the 95th percentile, I've overcome that. So that means I still struggle some, but, but not near as much as I, I used to. But, but back in those days, um, we just got into trouble. We had a lot of credit cards, and we just bought a lot of stuff, and we wanted uh, newer, bigger, better, and we just we pursued it. And there was a day when that kind of came crashing down because we could no longer make the minimum monthly payments on all of our bills. You know, we were about $200 a month short of making our minimum payments to everybody, and so not everybody got paid every week, I mean every month. It's like creditor A and B, we would, we would not pay them this month, but we would pay the rest. And so we would get these letters from creditor A and B, and we know we're behind and all that. Next month, we would pay A and B, and then we would have to not pay C and D. And so it was kind of like we literally, month to month, could not afford to pay even the minimum payments on all of our debt. We were $200 short every month, and that was miserable. We, had to, we juggled this for really several years, and it put pressure on us. I mean, it put pressure on our marriage. Ruthie and I have now been married 34 years, and, and um, the first 12 of them were not real, real they weren't the best. I mean, we had a lot of pressure uh, financially, um, and I got tired of it. I, I, want, I want to have a relationship with my wife to where, man, we just connect well, we communicate well, we love well, and, and fi financial struggles really can mess all that up, and I was tired of living like that. You know, I was tired of, of the late payment notices I would receive in the, mail, in the mail. I was tired of the insufficient funds notices I would receive. I was tired of the, the phone calls from creditors. I was tired of the relationship difficulties this brought into our extended family because we had a family member who was kind enough to loan us some money to help us get out of our financial mess. And then we were not able to repay the creditor as we, I'm sorry, the relative. We, we couldn't pay, pay our relative as we had promised. Now, do any of you know the definition of a distant relative? <laughs> I know one way that that can occur, and man, it was painful. Now, we were able to make things right eventually with that relative, but that was a painful season. You know, I was tired of the inability to really enjoy life. I remember I wanted to escape from my financial misery, so I thought, we just need a vacation. I just got to get away. I can't think of the financial misery, so I decided to take my family to Six Flags Over Texas. We have three daughters, and they were younger at that time, and so um, we came here, and I remember riding the parachute ride and, and looking down at my daughter Carly's face, and she was having so much fun. She was beaming. She was just, wow. She was just, this, this was just making her day. And as I sat there looking at her enjoyment, I became painfully aware that I was not having fun. And the reason is because I had put the gasoline to get there on the credit card, the hotel where we were staying on the credit card, the food on the credit card, the Six Flags tickets on the credit card. I did not know how I was going to pay for these things when we went back home. And so what happened is financial debt was robbing the joy out of life from me. Now listen, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. But financial debt had robbed that joy from me. And so even though I was a follower of Jesus, even though I was a pastor, I didn't have that strength. I didn't have that joy of the Lord. And it was because of our financial situation. You know, I became very convicted and very miserable over what I'm about to tell you. Um, our finances were in such a bad place that I didn't see there was any way that I could tithe and give offerings. Um, now, I'm a pastor, and I make my living from the tithes and offerings of God's people, and yet I wasn't tithing and giving offerings, and God really convicted me about it because I should be the leader in generous giving, you know, and, and that's what I want to be. And, 
and yet I was not. And the guilt that came from that was just so hard to deal with. But you know, there was a day on October 22nd a few years ago that my wife and I, um, we really uh, made some changes. I, I was at a point of an emotional train wreck um, but, but we began to see in the Bible some strategies to get out of debt quickly. And um, so we did something on that day that forever changed our lives. And as a result, we were able to pay off all of our debt except, um, the, uh, except the house in five months. Um, and I'll show you the numbers today, this afternoon. But um, we were able to pay off a 30-year mortgage in four years and two months. Uh, I'll, I'll show you in the seminar this afternoon, there's multiple ways that you can pay off a house very fast if you want to. We have paid off two different houses in less than five years each. Um, and so, it, and it's not that we make a lot of money, but it is we've learned some very interesting financial tweaks that can create positive cash flow for people fast. And then when you have positive cash flow, you can do things that you couldn't do when you're, you know, you're just barely getting by so so anyway we have seen so many people over the years apply these principles we we've seen a medical doctor in Tulsa pay off two hundred and eighty nine thousand dollars worth of debt in one year uh, we've seen an attorney in El Reno Oklahoma pay off two hundred fifty eight thousand dollars in one year we have seen so many cool things. There's a band director out here in McKinney Texas who attended this seminar and he called me back um, the the Thursday following and he said by following your strategies I've been able to create a positive cash flow of eleven $1 hundred dollars per month in four days now listen he just tweaked a few things in fact let me make a statement to you here today there are some of you in this room maybe many but certainly some who after today's seminar you'll be able to um, increase your your positive cash flow by five hundred dollars or more by noon tomorrow by noon tomorrow by making a couple tweaks and and this is one of the things God has gifted me in you know I my IQ I'm not sure what it would be uh, but I but I know that I have a creative IQ that would be pretty high and so God has given me the ability to see things in a creative way and by shifting the puzzle pieces around all of a sudden person goes from 200 a month short to 500 a month long just like that without getting another job or anything and so so that this afternoon there will be people in this room that by tomorrow at noon you're, you'll have an extra $500 a month um, and so it's not that you're going to get a raise it's that we're going to tweak, it, it's in the money that you're already making. Does that make sense? It's, it's within the money you're already making with a couple tweaks. We can see that happen in so many people. And so that, that's a whole lot of fun. Now, I want to uh, share with you the Bible foundation of this uh, seminar, which it comes from the book of Joshua. And for you to best understand this, I need to set up the context here. So I'm going to use the stage to represent some things. Over here by where the choir was uh, standing and singing, we want this to represent the land of bondage, the land of Egypt. You might remember that God's children were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Well, Moses led them out of slavery. The Red Sea parted. They went through on dry ground. They ended up in the wilderness wanderings for 40 years. And then then there was the time when they were to take the promised land. Now Moses dies and lead, hands the baton to Joshua and Joshua is gonna lead God's people in to the promised land. And so over here the Jordan River parts and God's children go in. Now I want you to think through this. Joshua was, Joshua was born over here in, in the land of Egypt and he was born to slave parents. Joshua grew up in a home where they didn't have enough money, they didn't have enough food, they didn't have enough resources, they, they barely survived, okay? Joshua experienced that, he grew up in it. And by the way, as a young man, when he was living over here, Moses chose him to be his assistant, even as a young man. The Bible says that Joshua served as the assistant to Moses. So Moses was mentoring Joshua even over here. Um, and then, uh, God takes God's people to the, the wilderness wanderings. Now, now look at this. 
Joshua was there, and now he's here. Joshua has experienced less than enough. Now he is experiencing just enough. The Bible says in the wilderness wanderings, it wasn't a time of savings. In fact, God would provide food one day at a time. At the end of the day, if there was extra food, you were to discard it. This is not a time of savings, but it was better than that because over there, they were just surviving. Over here, they're not thriving yet, but they do have enough food to take care of them. But God really wanted to move them over here. Now, this is is the promised land. This is the land flowing with milk and honey. This is the land of abundance. This is the land to where if you want to pick a, some, some grapes, you need two men and a big pole on your shoulders because the clusters of grapes that go on that pole, they're so plentiful, it's too heavy for one man to carry. This is the land of more than enough, and Joshua led God's people here. Now think about this. This is a great picture for us. Here is a man who grew up with less than enough, He experienced just enough, and then he went to more than enough, and that's a journey that I want to take you through today by using Joshua as our primary character. So uh, let me read from Joshua chapter 10, and then um, I would uh, want to share with you these points and invite you back this afternoon. Would you stand as I read from Joshua 10, beginning in verse 5 through verse 14? Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us, because all of the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hands. Not one of them shall be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up from Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large stones down from on the enemies, um, and more of the enemies died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day that the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Lord, over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, and the nation avenged themselves itself of its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jashar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There's never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Okay, please be seated. I want to show you five steps from, mostly from this passage. Some of them are from other parts of the book of Joshua, but, but step number one, if you're a note taker, write this down. Joshua defined his enemy. He knew who his enemy was. It was a people group called the Amorites. He had snuck into that country 40 years earlier to spy on, the, on them along with Caleb and 10 other spies. And, and he knew what he was up against. And he knew these things about the Amorites. The Amorites were giants. They were nine or 10 feet tall. In fact, several generations later, Goliath was born and Goliath comes through this bloodline. And he was a giant because his ancestors were giants. So here's what Joshua knew. He knew that the people he were going to have to defeat were physically bigger and stronger than him and his army. Joshua also knew that the the Amorite armies had superior numbers. So not only are they bigger and stronger physically, they have a bigger army. From a human perspective, it seems there's no way for Joshua to win this war. And yet, in spite of that, Joshua believed God would make a way even when there seemed to be no way. Now, Ruthie and I, when it came to our financial life, we began to use these conquering strategies to help us to conquer our debt. Incidentally, one of the coolest things about the seminar this afternoon is this. Regardless of your financial condition and regardless of your age, there's something in the seminar for everybody. And I, I had a lady who's a church secretary in Corpus Christi call me and say, after your seminar, 
I paid off every debt to my name except my house, and I'm on track to have the house paid for in four more years. She said, but in addition to that, I've lost 68 pounds, and I've kept it off. And I said, well, how, what does that have to do with the seminar? She said, well, the seminar taught conquering steps. And, and though you and though now I have used it to conquer debt, I've also used it to conquer my addiction to overeating. That blew me away. You know, sometimes you're, you're serving in one way and God uses you in surprise ways. And it's really cool because God can do so much through you when you serve him. I had a call from a guy who said, hey, I uh, attended your seminar and I have not only have I paid off all debt but the house, but I'm on track to pay off the house in three years. He said, but I've also broken a two pack per day cigarette habit I had been stuck in for 10 years. That's amazing. He attended the seminar, never touched cigarette again. And only God can do that, friends, okay? This is a God thing. And I want you to anticipate today, God is gonna do something transformative in your life. Anywhere in your life that you're just surviving, but you want to thrive, this seminar will help you greatly. I know people who have attended this seminar in order to build better marriages, in order to build more successful businesses, in order to become better students, and on and on the list goes. I just want you to know that yes, we're gonna be focusing on financial thriving, but it will also show you how to thrive in any area of your life that you really want to thrive. So, step one, Joshua defined his enemy. Now. We know his enemy was the Amorites, but in the financial world, my wife and I, defined in, uh, we define debt as our enemy. Now, I'm not suggesting the Bible prohibits debt, for it does not. There are a few occasions when debt makes sense. Um, in fact, my church, Sugar Creek Baptist Church, where I serve, um, we are voting tonight to go take a $4.2 million loan to buy a, a church property for another campus. And the church will vote yes, and our church is going to take on some debt. And it's okay. We've prayed about it. That, listen, there are times when it makes some sense to go into debt. So I don't prohibit debt. The Bible doesn't prohibit debt. I'm not a zero debt guy. But, but I do know this. My wife and I, the way we were using debt, it was a killer. I mean, it was a nightmare. We weren't using it in ways that were in any way close to smart. And, and let me just give you this example. Um, we, we looked closely at our credit cards and what we discovered is we were paying approximately 96% interest on our credit cards and didn't even know it. And did you know, many in this room right now are paying 96% interest on their credit cards and you don't even know it. How can this be possible? Well, I'm just gonna illustrate this way and then I'll prove it this afternoon, but I don't have time to prove it right now, but I'll illustrate it. Is it possible to pay 0% interest on a 9.9% .9 interest credit card? Yes, it is possible. How do you do it? Pay it off in full on time each month. Now think about this. Anytime a credit card company creates a way for you to pay less than the stated interest on the card, you can be sure they've created ways for you to pay more than the stated interest on the card. Did you know that APR doesn't stand for actual percentage rate? It stands for annual percentage rate. And let me tell you who pays the annual percentage rate. Nobody in the world. Not one of you pay the annual percentage rate. It is next to impossible to pay the annual percentage rate. You're either paying way more or way less. You can't pay the annual percentage rate. Is it theoretically possible? Yes, but it, it would be so hard and take up so much of your time that it is so not worth it. I just want you to know this. Many people, many, the majority, are paying way more in interest than the stated interest rate on their card. For us, it was 96%. I'll show you the numbers and prove it on the board this afternoon. Step number two, Joshua declared war against his enemy. There comes a point when a person has to say, I'm all in or I'm chickening out. And that point came when Joshua and his army came to the Jordan River. To cross this river was to go into the land that they were gonna have to fight in order to obtain. They could have decided, ah, oh, it's not worth the risk, and they could have retreated. Or they could say, 
We're declaring war. We're going to do this. We're going to obey God. No matter what happens, even if we die, we're going to do this. And that was Joshua's decision as well as the army. Now, if, if, if I were the, the general or the leader in that army, and here's the Jordan River, which was at high, it was high and swift, I would have probably said, God, if you'll split the river, I'll lead my people through. But God didn't say, God didn't work that way. He says, no, you step into the river first and then I will part the water. Now listen, this is a principle that's true in all of life. God always wants to see our faith first. That's always the case. And then when he demonstrated faith, he put his foot in, the river parted and they went through on dry ground. Now that's when they're saying, we're declaring war, we're serious, we're after this thing. They got through the Jordan River, they decided we never wanna forget this experience. God just demonstrated again that he's with us, that he's gonna help us, that he's gonna strengthen us, and he's gonna uphold us with his righteous right hand. And so they decided to create a monument. I, I would consider it a marker moment in the life of, of Israel. One, uh, each tribe of the 12 tribes got a stone and they put these stones together and created this stone monument. And they did it because they wanted to remember that God is on their side. He's going to help them. He's going to strengthen them. He's going to uphold them. And he just proved it by walking through this river and they're going to leave this here and come back and visit this anytime. This is, this is like a little museum peace for the Israelites sitting out in the open near the river they'll bring their kids back they'll bring their grandkids back any time in the future when you for, when you're doubting God they would come back to that that marker and this afternoon I'm going to show you how to create a marker moment in your life we're not going to build a monument with rocks but we're going to pull off the same thing and what happens is you're going to, if you choose to, by the way, I'm not pushy about anything I say. In fact, I don't care if you do anything I say. I hope you do because it'll bless you, but I love you like you are whether you do it or not. So, so I'm not going to be pushy at all, but I am going to be excited some. So, so, here, so if you decide to create this marker moment, it is the fastest way I know to transform your mind. It's the fastest way I know to be going. For example, Ruthie and I were going toward more and more debt, more and more stuff, bigger and nicer houses and more cars and bigger cars and nicer cars, etc. We were moving toward that, moving toward materialism and greed and keeping up with the Joneses. Now, we created the marker moment and instantly our mind was so changed, we turned around. And when we were this way, we were increasing our debt when we were this way we were defeating our debt and it happened like that because of the marker moment and so i'll show you how you can create one of those and if you create it whether it's for finances or something else it helps you to to renew your mind in such a way that you are transformed transformation long-term permanent and huge change it is, it's very exciting. Change for the better. Change in ways that you will love, not change in ways that you're going to hate. You're going you're gonna to go from the devil stealing, killing, and destroying you or attempting that to the abundant life, the, the amazing life that God really wants you to experience while you are here on planet earth. Because one of the reasons Jesus died was to not only get us to heaven, but to help us to experience abundant life while we're on planet earth. And so I'll show you one of the tools from the Bible that you can use to help you with that. Number three, Jericho. The point is Joshua demonstrated his faith and he did it multiple times. Jericho is one of the big ones. When he goes to Jericho, he sees this huge wall surrounding the city. I don't know what he thought when he saw the wall, but if, if it were me, I would have probably thought, Lord, how do you want us to climb over those walls? And God might have said something like this. You're not going to climb those walls. And Joshua might have said, what are we going to do? Are we going to take our bows and arrows and shoot stray arrows over the walls in hopes to kill our enemies that way? God might have said something like this. 
You won't need bows and arrows. In fact, drop your weapons and pick up trumpets and march around the walls while playing some pretty music. Now let me ask you, did, did God's command make sense to the human finite mind? Of course not. What did Joshua need more than anything else at this point, in my opinion, would be Apache helicopters. But God said, forget that. Drop your weapons, pick up trumpets, march around the walls and play some pretty music. Now watch this. Joshua obeyed God even when God asked him to do something that didn't make any sense. This is significant. Here's why. God wants to see your faith first. It's an amazing thing. Now, when, notice, when Joshua showed his faith by stepping in the river, it recruited God's supernatural help, and they went through on dry ground. When Joshua said, drop your instruments, we're going to march around these walls the, the number of days and the number of times God has told us to, that was silly from a human perspective. That's not a good battle plan, but that's what God said to do. Joshua said, we're doing this God's way. We're going to obey him, and even if we get killed, we're going to obey him. But watch this. Joshua demonstrated faith. He's passing the faith, te faith test. He's passing it again. God knocks the walls of Jericho down before him and enables him to an amazing victory. Now, when we get to this part of the seminar, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some things with you that will, will really you're going to question them for a while. They're not going to just set easy in your mind, and I'll tell you why. I'm going to ask you to do the opposite of what the best-selling authors in America say today about debt elimination. The exact opposite. You, when you hear it, you're going to think, now there's no way that can work. That's exactly what Ruthie and I felt when God showed us what to do. But we decided we're going to obey God even if even if it doesn't work, and even if it kills us, and we did. And as a result of it, God knocked the walls of our debt down before us and enabled us to an amazing victory, and to God be the glory. So I'll share with you these principles, and you'll be able to do the same, or to tweak them, or to choose the ones you want to do, choose the ones you don't want to do. They will apply to different people in different ways. Certainly, if you have financial debt, and you want to get out of that fast, and start saving for retirement and other things, that's gonna be a huge part of this too. But at the same time, this is going to really just share some conquering strategies to help you move from surviving to thriving. So, step number four is this. Joshua decided to take action. Now, this point in the seminar, it's gonna get very practical, and I'm gonna show you how. How we went from 200 a month short to 300 a month more than we needed, in three weeks. That's what happened for us. We, went, we then went from 200 a month short to 750 a month extra in five months. We then, and, and we began the house payment at the beginning of this process. So in four years and two months into this, we're gonna show you how we went from negative 200 a month to over positive 2,000 a month. Man, that's a whole different lifestyle. And that all happened for us within, within five years. Uh, I don't remember which service I've said this in, so if I'm repeating myself, I apologize, but we have paid off two different houses in less than five years. And I'll show you in the seminar this afternoon different ways that you can pay off a house fast should you choose to. And, and man, it brings a great sense of security, joy, and it's really hard to explain, but it, it's, an, it's an amazing experience. Um, I'm also gonna show you exactly how See, this is the house section of the seminar, and I'm gonna show you how that band director created a positive cash flow of $1,100 per month in four days after the seminar. You know, I made a, I, I've made some stupid mistakes in my life. In fact, the longer you know me, the less impressed you'll be. But, but you know, one mistake I made is when that band director called me and told me that he had gone he had created $1,100 in positive cash flow in those four days. Well, he told me how he did it. It's very doable. Many people can do it. And the next weekend, I was at another seminar, okay? And I was so pumped up about the band director. And so the next week, I made this statement. I said, um, that band director, 
He created 1,100 positive cash flow in four days, and somebody in this room is going to do the same thing. And then I thought, oh, Bruce, that was a stupid statement because you really don't know. But, but I got a call the next week, four days later, from someone who says, when you, t- when you said somebody would do that, I thought you were crazy, but I did the same thing, and I've created $1,100 a month in positive cash flow too. Now, let me tell you this. One of the things God has gifted me in is this, and I've done some personal one-on-one financial coaching, and here's, here is my strength. By making tweaks in your budget, you can create positive cash flow very fast. And I am going to say with confidence right now, somebody, maybe several in this room, will create $500 in positive cash flow by noon tomorrow. Some of you in this room, I don't know, it's very possible to create 1,000 positive cash flow by noon tomorrow. I don't promise that. that. That one occasion, I promised it. So I can't promise it, but I can tell you this, I see it happen all the time. And I'm not talking about you've got to get a second, jo- second job by tomorrow at noon. I'm not, that's not it. It's, it's tweaking what you've already got. There are some tweaks that can take you from a negative cash flow to positive cash flow quick. And then when you get the positive cash flow, here's what you do. You do what you want, but you can either pay off debt fast or you can build up retirement fast or build up an emergency reserve fast because you've got this extra money each month. And so that's, that's one of the key things that this seminar does. Watch this. We live in a world which teaches slow debt elimination. You know, I was surprised that you could get a seven-year car loan a few years back when those came out, but now it's possible to get a 10-year loan on a car. Right now, you can get a 50-year loan on a house in America. What is this? Here's what it is. It's a philosophy that says this. Buy as big a house, as nice as a house you can, and we'll help you do it by stretching out your payments for 50 years. See, we're moving from a 30-year mortgage to a 50-year mortgage. Here's what America is saying. We want you to pay off your debt slower so you can get a bigger, better, nicer house. And used to, the longest car loan you could get was four years, and now it's 10. They're saying, hey, we want to help you get a bigger, better, nicer car, and the way we can do it is stretch out the payments for 10 years. Now, that's the general direction of our world. But let me tell you the difference in Bible-based debt elimination and world-based debt elimination. Bible-based debt elimination is fast, 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 fast. I'll prove it from the Scripture this afternoon. God doesn't want his children to be in long-term oppressive debt. Now, there are times debt may be uh, something that God wants you to do to buy a house or something, but, but so God doesn't prohibit it, but he doesn't want us to be in long-term oppressive debt. Every story in the Bible that deals with debt illustrates pay it off fast, pay it off fast. I'm gonna show you about a widow this afternoon that was in deep debt to the point her sons were about to be taken as slaves. She went to God, the man of God who told her what to do. She was debt free in 30 days, 30 days, totally debt free. Every story in the Bible that talks about debt shows fast, 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 aggressive. By the way, if anybody in this room has ever taken Final P- Financial Peace University, I have taken it. I do love it. Do you know that snowball that Dave Ramsey helps you to create? Well, if you attend this afternoon, I'm going to help you put that snowball on steroids. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a snowball that just goes slow. That's boring. I want this thing to go boom, 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 boom. Get to the bottom and be done. And that is biblically based. I will prove it to you this afternoon. And it is so exciting when you start seeing, wow, that went fast. That went, oh my goodness, we're already to 500 a month in positive cash flow. Now, I'm talking about the snowball there. We're going to create fast cash flow in your snowball, but we're going to create fast cash flow by making tweaks by tomorrow at noon. So you're going to have multiple ways to create cash flow fast as a result of this seminar, which the final step in it is that Joshua depended on God. Now, God parted the Jordan River. Uh, Of course, before that, he parted the Red Sea. God throws hailstones from heaven on the enemies, and more people die that way than Joshua and his army killed with the sword. God basically stopped the sun in the sky for about a whole day. Here's what was happening. Joshua and his army were fighting the enemies, and they had great momentum. 
but the sun was going down and back in those days they didn't have night vision goggles and so when it got dark they had to quit fighting so Joshua and them would have had to retreat sleep come back the next morning at daylight well Joshua didn't want to lose this momentum they were about to win this thing and so he just said God would you please keep keep it daylight for a little bit longer so we can capitalize on the momentum God said okay so God gave him about an extra 24 hours of sunlight and Joshua and his army completely capitalized on the momentum and won that battle at Gibeon Um, so it's interesting to see how God wants to help you know God wants to help you get out of debt God wants to help any of his followers get out of debt the Bible proves this um, when Peter comes to Jesus in Matthew 17 and says hey Jesus you and I have a debt we owe money to the tax office and neither of us have money so what are we going to do Jesus said okay you're right we do have a debt and we do need to pay it so you go fishing the first fish you catch look in the fisher's mouth you'll find a gold coin take it to the tax office it'll be enough to pay off your debt and mine so Peter obeys now think of this Peter is a professional fisherman by trade He's caught thousands, if not millions, of fish. He's looked in all their mouths. There's never a gold coin in the mouth of a fish, and he knows it. So this sounds silly to him, but what does he do? He obeys Jesus even when Jesus asks him to do something that seems silly. He goes goes fishing, he catches the fish, looks inside, there is a gold coin in there. It is amazing. When Jesus asks us to do something that seems unreasonable, do it. Do it. It's easy to follow Jesus when he asks us to do something that makes sense. But when he asks us to do something that doesn't make sense, we're thinking, oh, that may not be Jesus. That's the devil talking to me. Hey, sometimes you know in your gut, Jesus has asked you to do something that just doesn't make sense. Oh, you're going to want to follow at that time. Peter followed. He got the gold coin. He took it to the tax office, gave it to him, and they confirmed that's enough to pay off all of your tax debt and that of Jesus Christ. This is one example of God helping his people who are in debt to pay it off. There are many other in Scripture. Did you know that David, who killed Goliath, did you know that one of the rewards for that was that David's father's house was paid off in full just like that? There are many stories in the Bible where God works it out to just, he helps people pay off debt. For Ruthie and I, we journaled all of this. I received a letter in the mail one day. It was sent anonymously, no return address. I open it up. There's a piece of paper folded up in there. I open up the paper and there's a $100 bill in it. Now, the paper had some writing on it. I didn't recognize the writing, but it said, Dear Bruce, I had a lost $100 bill. And I asked God to help me find it. He told me he would help me find it, but he told me when I found it, I was to send it to you. So here's the $100. It was signed in Christ. I have no idea where it came from. But I'll tell you this. In the first five months of our conquering debt journey, of our moving from surviving to thriving financially journey, God brought us 48 occasions of surprise money. This is money we were not expecting. It's money we did not work for. It's money that boom here's some money boom here's some money boom here's some money I was driving a Honda automobile back then and um, got a check in the mail from Honda for 400 and something bucks for saying hey somehow we overcharged you and here's the 400 and something bucks I mean these are just weird things but but they've never happened to me before and all of a sudden we start applying these truths and now they're happening and 48 times in five months God brought us money we weren't expecting I'm just telling you, God wants to help you get out of debt or he wants to help you move from surviving to thriving in your marriage or in your work or maybe just in your personal discipleship. There are many areas that we want to grow and become better and you will receive information and help and tools this afternoon that will help you do just that. It is my prayer that all of you show up and that six months from today you're going to look back on today and when you look back you're going to say i created a marker moment on january 29th and i've never been the same since and you're going to be able to see and share the things god has done in your life since that time
And five years from today, looking back and saying, man, that marker moment, it so transformed me. I've never been the same. It's been a permanent change. And, and the joy of the Lord is back in my heart and is my strength. Now, before I uh, close, I just want to say this. All of us have a bigger problem in our lives than financial debt. The Bible calls it sin debt. The Bible even refers to sin as debt on a couple of occasions. One of those is in the Lord's Prayer. Depending on what version you memorize the Lord's Prayer in, one version says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Another version says, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, why would those, why would they be translated differently? Well, the word there, mean, it can mean trespasses and it can mean debt. So, but, but the bottom line is, we have a sin debt that has to be paid. And we cannot pay it off ourselves. It's too big for us. And the only way for it to be paid off is to trust in Jesus Christ to pay it off for you. To trust him by faith, to receive him into your life, and to follow him from, from this day forward. If you don't know for sure you're sin debt free, you're going to have the opportunity to do that. You can become sin debt free in five minutes. It may take us five years to get you financially debt free, but sin debt free can happen in five minutes. And so here in a moment, Pastor Chad's going to be here at the front to receive you. And um, you just come forward and say, Pastor Chad, I'm not sure I'm sin debt free. Or come forward and say, Pastor Chad, I still am very afraid of what's going to happen when I die. And, and I just want peace about that. And he'll be glad to pray for you about that very thing. Do you know the last three words that came out of the mouth of Jesus before he died? He could have said something to his mom. He could have, could have said, Mom, I love you. I'm going to miss you, but I'll see you in heaven. He did talk to John and say, Hey, please take care of my mom. But those weren't his last words. He said, I love you, but those weren't his last words. The last words that he said, he saved, he said, hey, the last words out of the mouth of a person before they die are the most important words that they say. And his last three words in his language at that day were the words tetelestai. Translated into our language, that means paid in full. Did you know when Jesus died on the cross, he was paying for something? He was paying for something in full, not in part. It wasn't like, I'm going to pay half of this, and then you with good works go earn the other half. No, no, no. He was paying for something in full, and it wasn't your mortgage, it wasn't your car, it wasn't your credit cards. He was paying for your sin debt. But you must receive, you must believe and receive in order to have that payment applied to your account. Your spiritual life will be stamped debt-free, sin debt-free, and you'll be on your way to heaven forever.